Good afternoon. My name is Paul McDonald and I'm the Park Superintendent in Phoenix Park. The Office of Public Works is delighted to announce the return of the annual Phoenix Park Biodiversity Festival, which will take place from Friday the 10th to Sunday the 12th of September. The full programme of outdoor events is scheduled for each day commencing at 9.30 and booking details for each event is available at www.phoenixpark.ie. The Biodiversity Festival brings together different aspects of citizen science and biodiversity and is a free, fun-filled festival with family activities suitable for young and old alike. The three-day outdoor festival is filled full of walking and talking events on topics such as bats, bees, trees, aquatic habitats, gardening, citizen science, hay, and lots more. This year, a series of lunchtime talks on various biodiversity topics will take place in the days leading up to the festival. Today, I would like to welcome Juanita Brown from the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Juanita has worked as project officer since 2017 and is responsible for engaging with communities to assist implementation of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Juanita is a zoology graduate with an MA in Media Studies. She's worked in communications for over 20 years, including television, radio, newspapers, books, and magazines. She also contributes to the communication activities of the data center and edits Biodiversity Ireland. With that, I'll hand you over to Juanita. Hi, thanks for having me. I'd like to thank the OPW for inviting me along to talk about the pollinator plan. And my name is Juanita Brown. I'm one of the project officers on the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and I work in the National Biodiversity Data Center. Biodiversity loss is a huge problem that we recognise nowadays across the globe. Ireland has wonderful biodiversity, over 30,000 different species living across lots of different habitats. Unfortunately, we are facing a lot of problems in those keeping those habitats in a good state. And we're seeing, you know, 17% of our species are threatened with extinction from Ireland. Why is pollination important? Why do we focus on pollinators? You know, there's lots of reasons, some economic crops that are insect pollinated uh, provide 59 million annually to the Irish economy. And that figure is actually growing every year. In the last 10 years, we've seen huge increases in the amount of uh, soft fruit and field vegetable production in Ireland. And I suppose it's important to factor in, you know, the idea that even if farmers aren't growing crops at the moment, even if it's a beef farmer, you know, it's about preserving the ability for your children and your children's children to actually diversify into that sort of production in the future. So you want to keep that pollination service available. It's also important for our health and well-being. You know, we're able to uh, buy lots of different varieties of fruits and veg. They would be restricted if we lost our natural pollinators. We would have to pay an awful lot more or they just might not be available. Also, you know, something that we tend to overlook is the impact on our wildlife and our landscape. So Ireland is marketed abroad as a very green uh, place, you know, beautiful place with lots of wildflowers. 78% of those are actually insect pollinated. So Ireland would look like a very, very different place without insect pollinators. More wild bees equals more wild plants. That gives us more insects and vertebrates, fruits and seeds to support birds and mammals and all our biodiversity. Who are the pollinators in Ireland? You know, most is done by our bees, and then a small amount is done by flies like hoverflies, and butterflies, beetles, even wasps do a little bit of pollination. So we have 99 different bee species in Ireland, one being the honeybee, just one species, 21 different types of bumblebee, and 77 different types of solitary bees. And these are our wild pollinators, the bumblebees and solitary bees. One third of our 98 wild bees species are threatened with extinction from Ireland. So the situation is serious. And not only that, you know, we're not talking about rare bees. We're actually also talking about common bumblebees. So we're in the uh, almost 10 years since the bumblebee monitoring scheme has been carried out by the National Biodiversity Data Centre, we're seeing declines year on year. So rare species are disappearing through loss of their semi-natural habitats. But common species are also in decline and their numbers are going down as a consequence of how we manage the rest of the landscape. 
So these are our 21 different types of bumblebee in Ireland. You can see great variety, beautiful creatures worthy of conservation in their own right. And it's important to say, you know, we tend to think of bees in the summer months, um, late spring, summer, and we might go to a garden centre and think of getting, a, you know, a plant for pollinators. But actually, it's either end of the season that they can be at most at risk. So in early spring, the queen bumblebee emerges from hibernation and she has to visit 6,000 flowers a day just to get enough energy to brood her first batch of eggs. So a whole colony is at risk if you know she can't get enough food to do that. And it's things like dandelions in early spring and willow and blackthorn in the hedges and whitethorn, you know, they're really, really vital to uh, feed our pollinators. And then in autumn again, there can be hunger gaps that can be detrimental for populations of bumblebees. Bombus terrestris again, the queen, the new queens have to weigh at least 0.6 grams, which is quite heavy for a, a bee, um, in order to successfully hibernate and survive through winter. So again, you're talking about the survival of next year's bumblebees. So it's things like ivy produce flowers at that time of the year um, when there might not be much else for them to feed on. So they're really, really important. Just in terms of the life cycle of bumblebees, you know, this is an apple orchard in Tipperary and obviously the apple farmer wants bumblebees on his land to pollinate the um, apple blossom so that he'll get better produce. But we can't just rely on them being there. Oh, that's a good habitat for bumblebees because of the apple blossom. It's actually the rest of the year. Is there going to be enough nest sites, hibernation sites? They will only really travel one to two kilometers from their nest. So those sites have to be very close to that apple farm. And will there be things like willow, dandelion, clover in summer, knapweed and ivy later in autumn, winter? It's really important that those foods are available to them to, for them to have a, a, you know, a balanced diet throughout the year. Solitary bees, we have 77 different types in Ireland. You know, they're very efficient pollinators. You might not hear as much about solitary bees, but they can do a lot more work actually than honeybees or bumblebees because they're not as good at collecting pollen. So honeybees and bumblebees are very specialized. They've evolved to, you know, collect pollen and moisten it and, and keep it stored on hairs, specialized hairs on their hind legs. But solitary bees, it's often dry or loose pollen on the hind leg or on the abdomen itself. So they're extremely inefficient and have to make an awful lot more trips to the nest and from flower to flower to collect enough pollen to, to leave for their larvae, which makes them excellent pollinators. Again, these travel even less, so they're only going to travel, solitary bees will only travel 100 to 200 meters from their nest. So those nest sites, have to be within that small area of the apple farm. So there have to be lots of food plants available right through from spring through to autumn. Where do they nest? So the solitary bees, 62 species are mining bees. So they nest in bare ground or on south or east facing banks. And it's really easy to create this sort of habitat. You're just taking off the top vegetation and the bees will find it. Then there's cavity nesting bees, there's 15 species. And also worth noting that, you know, you are only appealing to about 10 species in these bee hotels. Whereas if you do expose the earth banks on the south or east facing banks, you're, you actually potentially could have 62 species that, you know, will find it. So what do we do when we have a problem like this? Two amazing women. Um, <laughs> Dr. Una Fitzpatrick in the National Biodiversity Data Centre and Professor Jane Stout from Trinity College Dublin. They were recording losses and declines in bees. And instead of just watching that happen, they decided to do something about it. They came up with this framework to actually help pollinators. It's proven that, you know, lots of small actions taken together can begin to solve these problems. So with starting out with 80 partners, we've a lot more now it's growing all the time. And the reaction has been really, really positive. The core message they decided to keep really clear and simple, that it's about looking at any land, any site you manage and say, ask yourself, does it provide food, shelter and safety for pollinators? The solutions are all evidence based. That's really important. The relevant sectors feed into the development each time. So 
that the communication is tailored for that audience. And we provide lots of different options so that you can choose what actions suit you. So we've produced a guide for schools, a guide for farmland, councils, businesses, local communities, gardens. We also produced how-to guides for specific actions that are a bit more complicated, site-specific guides for the likes of sports clubs, wind farms and golf courses. It was also really important to actually work together to, instead of us trying to reach all of those audiences, to actually work with organizations that are already doing that. So I suppose the idea is to create these networks of pollinator friendly habitat, that everyone is picking their actions, even if it's just one or two small actions, be it a local authority, a school, residents associations, gardens, businesses, religious properties, but taken together, you're creating this network of pollinator friendly sites. Likewise, you know, when we're working with uh, Irish Rail or uh, Transport Infrastructure Ireland, you're encouraging pollinator friendly road verges, you're making your towns and cities hopefully more pollinator friendly, and it's linking a lot of those areas. But the pollinator plan has been seen a lot of success uh, and we're so grateful because it's all down to people just wanting to get involved and reacting really positively to it. The first plan, the first five years of the plan, you know, we concentrated on 81 actions, they were delivered. Part of that was producing these evidence-based toolkits by sector. 55% of councils had become partners by the end of 2020 and that's growing all the time. There's over 162 local communities through the Tidy Town scheme and so on that have become pollinator friendly. We've reached all the primary schools in the Republic. Business supporters continue to increase. And again, they have just come to us and said, what can we do? We want to do something for biodiversity. And there's a framework there and, and clear instructions and evidence-based actions for them to follow. Parks have also become pollinator friendly and it's been amazing to work with Antashka on the Green Flag for Parks Pollinator Award. You know, lots of parks are reducing mowing, creating meadows, uh, just managing their park in a very, very different way. And OPW have been really central to that and have won lots of awards. We also have a mapping system called Actions for Pollinators. So that's where people can go in and actually log their sites and map uh, where they've taken actions, be it a tidy towns group or a school or in your own garden. So that's that's been invaluable to actually, um, you know, be able to track those changes through the landscape. We have the All Ireland Bumblebee Monitoring Scheme and those recorders who are volunteering their time to go out and monitor bumblebees, that's increasing all the time. So people want to learn to identify bumblebees and help the national records so that we can actually see what's happening in the landscape. We're also raising awareness all the time. You know, we, there's also a farmland uh, European innovation project. And that's a really exciting project because it's looking, it's working with 40 farmers across lots of different intensity types and different farming types to come up with uh, actions that are accessible and can make any farm pollinator friendly. So that's a really exciting project. There's also an Irish pollinator research network which was established in 2017 and it's growing all the time and it forms the basis for all our information on pollinators in Ireland. People uh, embrace the plan so much it is regarded as a success story internationally. We produced this booklet at the end of the first five years called Working Together for Biodiversity and it was really really difficult. We could have chosen hundreds and hundreds of stories but we, we came up with a final 80 just to show examples of different actions, different groups or different councils or you know, individuals are taking. Um, and the variety of stories is really amazing. You know, it's really heartening to see all these different actions. And again, that idea of working together, it is going to change something. So I'd really recommend if you want to go onto the website to have a look at those. Um, you know, I think the, another key success was working together this whole idea of you know agreeing a framework that's practical realistic and um, we work with a, a brilliant cross-sectoral steering group it's all ireland uh, and we really embrace public consultation so the first plan had 81 actions the second for 2021 to 2025 is even more ambitious so we've really you know tried to build on the successes and failures of the first plan 
the aim is always to be positive and constructive and celebrate the biodiversity we have. And I think that's been really key as well. You know, it can be really um, intimidating to, to, to read an awful lot about, you know, climate change and biodiversity loss. But the great positive side of the pollinator planet is that we get straight into what you can do about it, what you can do in your own garden or in your village or your town. Um, and it, that is really good. We've been told over and over again that for people's mental health, it's been a really positive experience to become involved. And I suppose you are asking people to care. You know, you're, you're telling them a story, you're telling them about hungry bees, and it's really heartening to see the reaction that people do want to help. All our information is, is free to access and easily accessible, I hope, on the website. You know, we've produced lots of videos and animations. The whole idea is to just share information. There's flyers and signage templates and, you know, um, posters, lots of lots of different ways of communicating with people. So the idea to continuously exchange knowledge and learn from each other, you know, that's something we always wanted to cultivate. So one council takes an approach that's really working for them to make a meadow pollinator friendly. They share that information. So we've had conferences where they share that knowledge with other councils, like Grace Tidy Towns groups. We have a newsletter each year from the Tidy Towns winners explaining what they have done and what they found useful and maybe the challenges they've met along the way. We use social media. We have lots of knowledge exchange blogs, blogs on the website. We have an ideas hub that you can go into and just, you know, get uh, inspiration for maybe your own projects. A really important part of the pollinator plan is tracking the implementation. So making sure it's working, seeing what actions are being progressed. And that's an ongoing thing that we, we sort of do all the time. We also want to track creation of pollinator habitat. So as I mentioned, our mapping system actions for pollinators does that for us. It's an amazing way of tracking that change in the landscape. We also, of course, have the monitoring scheme and thing, surveys like the flower insect time count that anyone can do. It's, it's very uh, accessible. You know, we encourage people all the time. That'll really help us if we have citizen scientists around the island actually doing the surveys for us. We'll be able to track changes in populations. So the guideline documents to actually explain what we're asking people to do. They all have the same sort of format. You're, one, we're asking people to protect what they already have, sites that are naturally pollinator friendly. Altering the frequency of mowing is a big one. Planting pollinator friendly plants, providing nesting habitats, reducing use of pesticides, raising awareness and tracking progress. So it's a standard format, which makes it easier to track progress across the island. I just want to give three key actions and um, discuss these in a little more detail so that we kind of get a taste of what those actions are, specifically looking at hedgerows, grass and pollinator friendly plants. So I suppose the key message is that from spring right through to autumn, we want to provide pollinators with a range of plants, a really balanced diet. And naturally, our native species are the best because that's what they've evolved to feed on. So things like willow, dandelion, clover, knapweed, bramble, ivy, really important to provide um, pollen and nectar for pollinators. One of the biggest ways you can help all biodiversity is to manage our hedgerows. You know, our hedgerows are this amazing network, ecological corridors that, are, you know, are, are already existing, but we just need to manage them in a slightly different way. So we've gotten very used to really tightly trimmed hedgerows, especially on roadsides, which is understandable if there's health and safety issues or sightline issues. But off-road hedges on farmland or parkland or housing estates, you know, we can let that grow a little bit longer. This was not how, what the countryside looked like, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, hedgerows were white in May because of blackthorn and whitethorn being in flower and they were absolutely you know bursting with food for pollinators and then later in autumn they produce berries for birds and mammals so if we want to help wildlife in general we should only cut every two to three years to actually let them bloom 
So that's a very visible thing we can see. If we can change that, it would just make such a huge difference to biodiversity. If you do want to plant a pollinator friendly hedge, you know, we have guidelines on how to do that. We have guidelines on how to manage them, you know, what you should be asking a contractor to do or um, a gardener to do in terms of keeping those pollinator friendly and keeping as much food available for biodiversity as possible. Another major area is grass cutting. So, you know, we have, it's a bit like the hedge cutting machines. We have right on mowers and we have strimmers and we are able to keep everything looking very neat but I think facing a biodiversity crisis you know we need to kind of reassess that does everything have to be neat and tidy because when you cut a lawn every week or every fortnight and it's like a golf course it might look nice to us but it's not offering any food for pollinators Another tip is to always remove the cuttings. Don't leave cuttings or mulch them back in because you're going to increase the fertility of the soil and wildfires then don't have a chance to grow because they can't compete with the grasses. So you could choose to have strips in your garden or a shape, a spiral. Lots of people are trying different things. And that clover that's going to come up and bird's foot trefoil, dandelions, dog daisies, they're really, really great sources of food. You might want to cut once a year or you can cut every six weeks, but it's all about having flowers in your garden or having flowers in your park. Flowers equal food for pollinators. So these short flowering meadows, as I say, is, you know, some of our actions are around these. They could be on road verges, they could be in gardens. So there's long flowering meadows, which are cut just once a year in September and the cuttings removed to reduce that fertility. Um, on roadside verges, you can see it as well. You know, you can cut a strip. This is a road in Limerick. Um, you can cut a one meter strip so that it's still safe for sight lines and for people walking, but you're allowing this verge that would have been cut traditionally to flower and to provide food for pollinators. People get in contact all the time looking for wildfire seeds. Where can I buy wildfire seed? And what they have in their heads are the you know, at the front of packets of wildflower seed. Um, but that is not native, you know, sunflowers and, and this sort of kind of really flashy um, display is not native to Ireland. What pollinators need is, you know, the native common species, things like knapweed, you know, uh, dog daisies. Really, you might, it might not look as good to us, but it's much, much better for pollinators. We would always recommend reducing mowing and removing cuttings as a much better way of allowing a meadow to develop naturally. Again, we can see, you know, two different approaches to a roadside verge. This is a very steep bank, you know, putting a lawnmower up there. Like, why are we doing that? What's it for? It's not actually helping with sightlines or anything like that. Why not just, you know, cut a one meter strip for walkers if you want? So we're getting a lot of photographs from around the country of these new approaches to managing our road verges, and it's really encouraging. This is Castletown House in Selbridge, and the meadows, the wildfire meadows there are just unbelievable. Rory Finnegan, the head gardener there, has done lots of videos for us and talked at our conferences about how he's let these meadows develop. Time in Park in South Dublin County Council, where they've reduced mowing over vast areas. Kilbarry Nature Park in Waterford. This is the apple green in Kinnegat. Again, you know, that would have been traditionally mown really tight and I think it looks beautiful. <laughs> um, Donna Rainey is an amazing woman in Northern Ireland who's worked, she's a nurse and she works in Causeway Hospital in Coleraine. And she encouraged uh, the management there to reduce mowing and the result has just been fantastic for both patients and staff to enjoy. So it's a really nice idea. This is another park in Monaghan, Scott's house. Again, just ideal location to let the grass grow, see what comes up. We also produce a lot of signage so that you can put up a sign and tell the public what you're doing so that they understand and um, it's more acceptable if you're reducing mowing, for instance. So all of those are available on our website. Then pollinator friendly planting. So very gaudy annuals that we're used to planting like geraniums, begonias, busy lizzies. These actually don't have enough pollen and nectar for pollinators. They just, they've been bred to be very showy. 
um, and they don't rely on insect pollination. So they just don't have those supplies of food. So we're not saying there's no place for them, but it's really good if you can mix in pollinator friendly varieties like Biden's or Bacopa or plant pollinator friendly bulbs like Muscari or Allium or Crocus. We have lots of lists of those species on our website. The planting code has lists of trees and shrubs and herbs, anything you can think of. It's also important to, to point out that, you know, uh, as a climate action, pollinator friendly planting is a lot more sustainable. You know, really traditionally, a lot of annual bedding plants were planted two or three times a year at, at a, a big cost and they were thrown out afterwards. And you're, you're thinking of that production, the travel, uh, you know, to bring them to a town, to put them in a garden center, you know, maybe they've come from abroad. All of that has an environmental impact. Whereas pollinator friendly perennials cost maybe around the same, but they can last 10 to 12 years. So it's about, again, looking at this culture, uh, you know, can we make it more sustainable? We also have lots of uh, ideas for pollinator friendly trees. A lot of people are doing community mini orchards, which is a really positive thing for any community. And on our website, you'll find lots of information about those. Two, three small things to be careful of. We do get an awful lot of queries about getting hives on land. There is this misconception that to help bees, you should have honeybee hives. It's actually not a biodiversity action. You know, beekeeping is very, very important, but keeping more hives and, and putting more honeybees out into a landscape is actually possibly going to add pressure on resources. So hives is not actually a biodiversity action. Um, there's also a big market at the moment for seed bombs. We don't recommend these. You know, it's not we would always recommend natural regeneration, but definitely seed bombs is a really inefficient way of trying to plant seed. And again, the big bee hotels aren't ideal. It's much better to go with small ones. Just to finish up, um, the pollinator plan is a call to action. It's about coming together to help pollinators, to help growers and, and farmers, to help our native wild plants, our mammals, our birds, and if we like eating food, it's about, you know, future food security. And I just like to thank you for listening. And please do go on to the website pollinators.ie. Thank you.